grateful for what I feel here this morning and so thankful for your worship, your praise. It's important, it's imperative, it's vital, it's crucial, it's necessary that you and I continually create a habitation for God to do what God and only God can do. God's habitation is your praise and my praise and so grateful for that. I want to invite you to grab your Bibles, your phone, your tablet. Turn with me to the book of Jonah. I know you've been standing, but turn to me. Turn with me to the book of Jonah, the second chapter, the last verse, verse number 10. And then I'm going to go right into chapter 3 as well. As you're locating the book of Jonah, the book of Jonah, chapter 2, uh, I want our church family to know this week, uh, in fact, after service today, our leaders will be headed out of town to do a strategy session for 2023 as we focus on what God is doing in our church, as we focus on what is next for our church, we want to make sure that we are leading this church to its best future. And so the office will be closed this week. So if you call the office and no one's here, if you swing by, just know that uh, we will be back Wednesday, but just want our church family to know that. Uh, obviously we have phones and we will be available uh, if there is a need, but certainly want you to be aware of that and so grateful for what God is doing in this church. I feel like I'm, I'm God's challenging me to preach to you and to our church and to our culture here in our church to go to where God has taken us. Jonah chapter 2, verse number 10, And the Lord spake unto the fish. The Lord spake unto the fish. Just think about that. And the Lord spake unto the fish. And it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Chapter 3, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Man, do I ever want to do that today. I want to preach what the Lord is bidding me to preach to you. So Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and ashes. He caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell? Who can tell? If God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger, that we perish not. Last verse, verse 10. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil, that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not it's a powerful story there's so much to unpack but I don't want to forget the real reason of the story I want to remind all of us the story it's not about the whale it's about Nineveh I'm going to say that again the story it's not about the whale it's about Nineveh. Would you put your Bibles, your phone away? Would you put your hands together? And would you give Jesus just a praise offering? Thank you, Lord. I need a fresh anointing. I need a fresh anointing, oh God. Anoint your people, oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Show your, show your neighbor your dental work. 
Tell them it's not about the whale, it's about Nineveh. Would you say that? You say that? We show them it. Smile, it's okay. You may be seated. Amen. The story of Jonah is one of the most famous stories in the entire Bible. It's legendary. It's mesmerizing. It's been debated. It's been really tried to think it could not happen. But the most famous part of the story is Jonah being swallowed by a great fish, the scripture says. We kind of interpret that as the probability of the well. More importantly about this story is how we preach to Nineveh and get this, and saw an entire city turn to God. If Nineveh and the story of Jonah in the book of Jonah is not one of the greatest revivals ever recorded in scripture, I don't know which one is. It is one of the most fascinating, all-encompassing move of God on the planet as recorded in scripture. God called Jonah to Nineveh. That seems innocuous to us because we may not understand Nineveh. But Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, a growing world power in that day. God had issued a destruction proclamation on the city because wickedness had risen to the level that God deemed it, it cannot go any longer this way. So God told Noah, I will destroy Nineveh. Now we think of Jonah leaving was that he just didn't want to do the work of God. But Jonah understood something about Nineveh. Nineveh was a wicked city. It was a exceedingly great city. I mean, it was big. It had population. It had influence. There was a lot of things going on in Nineveh. But of all things that Nineveh was, it was also very intimidating. It has been said in le legends that they would kill their opponents and they would go to war and kill their enemy. They would drag their bodies to the city and cut off their heads and then begin to stack their skulls one on top of the other and created huge huge sticks of heads that would begin to appear as people walked into the city of Nineveh. All of it as a sign of the barbaric ways of the Ninevites. This is what Jonah was asked to do, go to a city that is so intimidating and so fierce and so scary that in his humanity and that in his own natural thinking, there's just no way that one man with one message could ever go to a city like that. Will there ever be anything different? So Jonah made the decision that he would run from God. And Jonah departed and he ran to a place that had a, a ship headed to Tarsus. Tarsus was as far away as you could get from Nineveh. Nineveh is in modern day Iraq today. And now Nineveh, uh, Tarshish would be like the other side of the Mediterranean, almost in Spain. He tried to flee as far as he could. The reason that he would take this ship and go to Tarshish because he knew that it wasn't a cruise ship, that it may take a year or longer just to arrive in Tarshish. I want to leave and never come back. I want to put myself in a place that God would have to use plan B to reach Nineveh. I want to place myself that God, I'm just no longer on the market to be used for your purpose and your kingdom. The details are fascinating, otherworldly. The things that would take place in the story are mesmerizing. It's ironic to me that now Jonah is on his way to Tarshish and there's a storm that rises up. I don't want to go too far in the details, but it comes to the point where they throw Jonah overboard. That's it. It's over. You're finished. This is a suicide attempt, if you will. There's no known big fish in the water. There's no escape route. Jonah, for all intents and purposes, was out of the game. Big fish comes and swallows him. 
What's funny to me is the only ones that lose anything in the story of Jonah, the only ones are the mariners that throw their belongings and their goods and throw their cargo out in the ocean trying to save the ship. They're the only ones that ever lose in the story of Jonah. Our world feels more like Nineveh all the time. It seems like we're playing on an unleveled field. We feel out overmatched and outgunned and overwhelmed and the odds certainly seem stacked against us. You can feel hopeless at times and the task can be dawning. And so it's easier just to play it safe. But as author and pastor Mark Batterson said and asked the question, when did we start believing that God wants to send us to safe places and do easy things? When did we start believing that what God's asking you to do is supposed to be easy and convenient and simple? It's not supposed to rearrange your priorities. It's not supposed to mess with your life. When did we start believing that living for God was just showing up and preaching and worshiping and behaving? And when did we start believing that God never asked us for more? That God never asked us to do anything that would change the world? That God would never invite us in a journey that would be revolutionary, that would absolutely change the, the trajectory of people's eternal souls. Well, when did we start believing that God wanted us to do things that we felt we were capable of doing, that we had it in our experience, that it's something that we could do with our eyes closed, so to speak? When did we start believing that? And yet our world is becoming more dark and destitute and broken. And there are people in this congregation that are going through hell. And they're fighting for their very lives. Their head is barely bobbling of water. They're trying to get a breath of air just to, for, to live, to survive. And yet the reality is the church is called. The church has been invited to a, an adventure that is absolutely called to change the world. We are called, I want to be clear here, are to change the world. If you ever want to know what the church is all about, it's not about potlucks. And it's not about organization only. It's not about even a, a Sunday score. It's not even about a platform. But really, it is called to bring the message of Jesus to a lost and dying and broken world. That is what the church is called to do. Amen. I want to speak it into your spirit. And Brother Brown, it's good to see you. Brother Darrell Brown, it's good to see you in church. God bless you. I know you've been. We prayed a miracle on you. Believe in God is healing your body. But you, but you are sitting among world changers. Uh, I know they may not have the, 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 the card in the corner office, but I want you to look at your neighbor right now. Would you just glance at your neighbor? And, and I want you to understand, you are sitting among world changers. Do you believe that anymore? Do you, do, do you understand that anymore? Do you realize that you are called to change the world for Jesus Christ? You are sitting among change agents. We are not called to be in the world and leave it like we found it. But we are called to bring influence and righteousness and godliness and hope to a lost, drowning, broken world. The Bible wants you to understand that so it gives you insight and analogies like you are the light of the world. Some of you think you're the light of the church. But that's not what the Bible says. We're not called to be the light of the church. We are called to be the light of the world. Your light counts only when it's shining in a dark world. You, you can hide in here, but you shouldn't hide out there. We, we are called to be the salt of the earth. We're change agents. We're Holy Ghost agitators. We're supposed to mix things up. We're supposed to cause things to get shift and to get a little bit loose. We are spiritual agitators. Your praise disrupts the, the hell's uh, uh, influence on you. When you lift your voice, you begin to irritate the devil that thought he had you, that thought he took your praise. But you're not called to play it safe. You are called to be a Holy Ghost agitator. Agitator. Can I just sweeten the deal? Everybody say sweeten the deal, Pastor. You're called to be fools for Christ's sake. Right? 
You're called to be a fool for Christ's sake. Now, it's not a matter if you're going to be a fool. You're a fool for something. You're a fool doing something. But the Bible says if you're going to be a fool, you might as well make it count and be a fool for Christ's sake. That's why we don't care what the world says. We're not bought by the world. We're not trying to be influenced by this age. We are here to stand and be different. We are going to be different. We are going to appear different. We're going to act different. We're going to live different. Come on, somebody. You might as well mark it down. You're already a fool. You're already a fool. You're already a fool. But I want to be a fool for Christ's sake. Well, Pastor, you just offended me. Well, sweetheart, I'm not trying to offend anybody, I promise you. But that's in the good old book right there. That already reminds us you don't have an option to be a fool. See, some of you are trying to get sanctimonious and put together. You're trying to keep it all in and try to uh, manage your impression like I'm cool, calm, and collected, like I got my stuff together. No, no, no. You're called to be dangerous for the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to step back from that. I don't want to yield from that. I want to declare it and prophesy that over your mind and over your soul. You are called to be a warrior. You're called called to be a soldier. You're called to lay down your life. You're called to fight the good fight of faith. You are called to make a difference. You are called to be a disciple maker. You are called to be a part of the body of Christ. You are called. When's the last time you absolutely did something by faith and did something crazy for God? When's the last time? See, it, it, you have to fundamentally believe something if, if you are going to be a fool for Christ's sake. When you're a wishy-washy, half in, part-time, I'll show up when it's convenient. I won't make church a priority. I'll put God on the back burner. He's my exit ramp. I'll use God when I feel like it. But when you're serious about it, you believe some things. Can I tell you what our fundamental about this? We have to believe that faith still works. You have to believe that faith, not in ourselves, faith, not in what we can do, not in intellect, not in being rational, not in just technology, but we believe there's a God that knows and does and can and will work on our behalf. I've come to tell somebody, don't ever surrender your faith. Don't ever let the devil lie to you and tell you that you don't know and you'll never have and God never will. You need to tell the devil, I believe by faith, Moses. I believe by faith, David. I believe by faith. And if faith worked for them, it's going to work for me. So let me just prove this to you. How many of you know, I'm not asking you to get caught up in the motion here. How many of you know that God has done a miracle in your life? Put your hands together and give Jesus a praise. Well, you have to believe that faith works. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, faith works. What do you believe in God to do? What are you believing God to do? I believe in God is going to save your soul. I believe God is going to set some of you free. I believe today God has come to lift you out of your miry clay, your pit of discouragement. You are chained up and bound and you haven't been free in a long time. But I believe today can be a day of a new beginning, a fresh start, a new vision of what God wants to do for you. We have to believe faith works. Somebody say amen. amen. We have to believe our message works. Right? Some of you don't get sloppy on this. Not every road leads to heaven. Not every faith is going in the same direction. Jesus said it. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. There's no other way around Jesus.
Jesus. Can I be honest with you? Don't get simple about that truth either. And don't get simple about this truth. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. If you know it, say it with me. In the name of Jesus Christ. For the... And ye... That's the message of the New Testament church. That is what is preached on the day of Pentecost. That which birthed the church. I'm not into trying to get you to say certain words. I want the Holy Ghost to fall on you and to dwell in you and for you to know it because you speak in heavenly language. Woo! Our message will work. I'm not backing away from this one God message. I'm not getting out of the Bible to make you happy. I'm not stepping out of truth to make us more popular. Can I tell you, they are dumping professors out of college that make a commitment. I know this. I can tell you a name right now that was asked to leave a teaching uh, pr uh, professor job because he couldn't sign a, a declaration of faith that aligned with their faith because the word of God doesn't allow that. I'm not here to preach on your doctrine. I need to do that better because you need to get this so deep in your heart that wild horses can yank it out of your soul. But we have to believe the message will work. So I believe the Holy Ghost can change your life and the Holy Ghost can rearrange your priorities. The Holy Ghost can give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. I believe the Holy Ghost can begin the start of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Woo! My goodness. Third thing we need to fundamentally believe is that you have to believe that God can do anything. Like, is there anything too hard for a God? I'm telling you, God is going to send revival in places you never dreamed of. Uh, God is working right now in places and nations and around the world. I know this to be true, that we can't even share. I'm telling you right now that God is going to save people you never thought were going to be saved. You never dreamed that they would ever turn their life around. In your mind, they are so far gone. They're so deluded, so entangled with sin. They're so messed up in their thinking that you don't ever think they'll be saved. But here's a thought that God put in my spirit. We need to believe in a way that honors God. I'm going to say that again. You need to believe in a way that honors God. Some of us are embarrassing God by our shallow faith and our anemic trust in him. God, I want to say it again. You can do anything. There's not a need in this house and those that are watching that you cannot heal, that you cannot deliver, that you not, cannot set free, that you cannot renew. There's marriages that can be stronger and healthier. There are teenagers that can find their purpose. There are lost souls that can find forgiveness. There are people that are addicted that can be set free. There are diseases that you can heal. There are oppressions that you can alleviate. I believe that. Come on, if you believe that with me, put your hands together. I believe that and I'm going to declare that and I'm going to say that to you and I want to speak that into your thinking. I, I want to change the condition of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Your mind needs to be renewed. You have been dragged down. You have been stepped on. You have been punished and punched. You have been cut. You have been hurt. You've got scar tissue to show it. You're wounded and you are wondering. But let me tell you about the story of Jonah. The book of Jonah is not about the belly of the whale. It's about Nineveh. The story of Jonah is not about the belly of the whale. See, sometimes all some people want to talk about is the belly of the whale. All they want to talk about is what's against them. All they want to talk about is what they're fighting, what's happened to them, what's taken place in their life. Some people's claim to fame is their problems. They don't mind sharing that on a regular basis. 
They got a woe is me mentality. They, they, they think everybody's against them, including God. They've been dealt a bad hand and life's unfair and they've been cheated some way, somehow. And I'm telling you, the devil loves you drinking that soup. He loves you feasting at that place. When you begin to talk about the belly of the well, I've been in the belly, I've been abused and misused, and I'm not making light of any of that. But can I tell you, you can get stuck in the belly of the well. They tell you what went wrong, how many times they tried, what they prayed for that God didn't answer. They got a list about how bad things are, what's on the horizon. They can tell you the pain, the tears, the struggle, the valleys, the death threats, and the rocks, and the pain they have been through. And I'm not minimizing all of that. I don't know a believer that hasn't faced their share of trials. Can I tell you? The story is not, not about Jonah in the well. It's about Jonah in Nineveh. Can I say that again? The story is not about Jonah in the well. It's about Jonah in Nineveh. That after you get through your issues and after you fight through the pain and after you make up your mind and after you tell the devil you swung hard and you swung low. But I rise today to tell you, I'm not done yet. God's not through with me yet. There is still a mission. There is still a divine purpose. There is still a call of God. There is still a fresh anointing. There is still gifts of the spirit. There is still a vision. God gave me a dream. I'm still a disciple maker. Somebody raise your hand right now. I want you to say it. I want you to say it. I want you to say it. Woo! I want you to say it. I want you to say it. You know why? Because when we talk about the well's belly, church becomes therapeutic, not transformational. Did you come for a pep rally? I could do it. I promise you. I used to do. I used to do better. I'll admit that. Have you come to be just pepped up a little bit? When your purpose is dangling and in front of you, when your divine mission has been given to you since birth. And you're going to let the hardships of life walk all over you and define you. I feel an anointing on me right now. You've been caged up too long. You've now painted the inside of the well. You're now starting to decorate the belly of the well. You've got cute names for the belly of the well. But it's not about the well's belly. It is about Noah and Nineveh. You need a, any kids around here? No. You need to shut up about how bad your life's been. Join the crowd. Join the abused. Join the mistreated. Join the lied at. Join those that have been walked away from. When is it ever going to be good enough? When do you ever have your pain redeemed? Not enough sex can redeem your pain. Not enough drugs in your body can redeem your pain. Not enough conversations can redeem your pain. But when you give them to God and said, God, you put me in the belly of the well so I can be used, so I can be used, so I can know. Come on, Gullitzville. Come on, Gullitzville. Come on, Gullitzville. It's time we get a mind shift. It's not about surviving the well. It's about going to Nineveh. Oh, I wish somebody would lift their voice, shout unto God. I'm telling you, because if we start talking about how many problems we have, we'd have a contest. We try to outdo one another. You've been sick? What, do you know what I've been through? 
I mean, I don't even have a heart. <laughs> right? You're, you're going you're gonna to one-up one another. How many know those people that like to one-up you, right? Like you go on a vacation and they just tell you about their vacation. They don't, they don't have the spiritual or the, the, the emotional bandwidth or they don't have the EQ to say, I'm not going to talk about me. I want to find out more about your vacation. Right? Right? Well, we're going to start saying about this and how bad this. I know life's tough. I know it's hard. I know there's a lot of bad stuff that goes on and things that bother us and mess with us. I know that. But can I give you a word? This is not heaven. If this was perfect, why would you want to go to heaven? Now, now, I, now I'm going to tell you, Brother Phil, you haven't been here a long time, but I'm preaching better than you're listening. I promise you. I promise you, Phil. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching better than you're listening. I promise you, Phil. All right? We, we, got, we got to get to the point. We got to get to the place where our problems get redeemed. And we give them to God and say, God, I can't go undo that. I can't go fix the past, but I can create a future in the presence of God. I I'm telling you, Gullitzville, we are coming to a time where you need to say, no matter what, no matter what God asks, I got to get my mind right, my soul right, my heart right, my spirit right. That's what we all talk about is. Just the belly of the well. So let me just share it with you. Let me, let me just remind you, jo Jonah was an imperfect man. If Jonah tells us about anything, Jonah's story tells us that God sometimes believes in us more than we believe in ourselves. That God chooses people that have the potential to run. That God chooses the people that mess things up sometimes. We've been through a lot and we face down a lot. And you're enduring a lot and some of you are going through things. And please believe me, I'm not minimizing all that. I'm not trying to shortchange you on your grief. I, I, I promise you I understand that. But I also know it's a trick of the enemy that tries to capture your heart and your affection by raising up issue after issue after issue. He's got a grocery list. You get over this one, he knows that he'll give you another one. Wonder when will I catch my breath? Do I ever get a break? What if you don't? You're going to not do the will of God? Because it's not perfect conditions? Because it's not pristine and idealistic of what you thought working and living for God and doing the will of God looked like? When do you ever understand that, that there's a sword in one hand and a trial in the other? That I'm fighting and surviving at the same time. That I'm trusting God to see me through because I'm, t I'm telling you, if you've got breath in your lungs, God's not done with you yet. God is raising up people in this hour to do his bidding, to speak words, to come alongside people that need Jesus. I want you to understand how powerful this is. That the message and the story of Jonah reminds us that one man with one message can change the world. Yet 40 days, and none of us shall be destroyed, overthrown. Yet 40 days. The enemy don't want you to say that. He doesn't want you to vocalize what God's put in your spirit. Because I'm going to say this because you need to hear it. The devil is afraid of what you're becoming. All of the pain, all of the trials and all the setbacks are just a part of God's strategy to set you up to reach your purpose. God is using your pain and your misfortune and your divorce and those that have walked out and lied and your firing and all the things that the people that died on you and left you, walked out of your life. God is going to use that and redeem that for his glory and his purpose. And the devil's petrified of what you're becoming. He's afraid you're going to get it. He's afraid it's going to make sense. He's afraid you're going to redeem it. He's afraid you're going to step in and say, God, I'm ready to be used. 
There's miracles in your mouth and there's miracles in your hands. There's miracles and there's prophecies in your spirit. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, uh, there's a boldness that's overcoming you uh, that you don't understand why, but all of a sudden uh, you feel an unction of the Holy One of Israel and now you're walking and you're thinking and you're talking and you're believing what God wants you to do. What's the option, people? Lay down and die. Lay down and die. But I will tell you, God understands and hell understands. You're becoming something the enemy doesn't have an answer to. I thought I had you. I thought that was your final. I thought that was the knockout punch. I thought that's the one that would cripple you permanently. I thought you would always be in the well's belly. I thought you would always be there. I thought it was over. And now you're on the streets of Nineveh. How in God's name does that happen? See, what you need to understand is in a world that is full of fear and a world that is in chaos and a world that is in pain in the world that is on the brink of disaster. I'm telling you, the end times are, are coming very quickly. You're not the problem, church. You're the answer. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you're not the problem. You're the answer. Look at the same one. Don't, don't look at somebody else say that. Look at the same one. And say, you're the answer. Yeah, I saw some people like, you're the problem, and you're the answer. Yeah, yeah, so that's, you're missing it, folks. You're missing it, okay? Bring it back. Bring it back, okay? It's the same person. You're the problem. You're not the problem. You're the answer. Okay? See, what I, I, I come to tell you, is I don't say that casually, and I don't say that to rev you up, and I don't say that, and I'm almost done. Brother Dago, you can come. Somebody, music, help me out, please. Because you have no idea what God wants to accomplish through you. you. You have no idea what God wants to do through you. All you know is what you have been through and what you have experienced, but you don't know what's next. You don't know what's next. You don't know what God is prepared for you. You don't know where God has already opened the door. You don't know what God has already provided the resource and means. And you don't, you don't know. But you got to be submitted to his will and submitted to his purpose. Because when you get over your issues, there's still a mission that God has for you. When you get over the hurdle and you get over the battle and you get over the wall, I want you to know the mission hadn't died. The mission is still there. But here is an observation that you need to understand. And I will say this a thousand times. Jonah never made it to Tarshish. It's amazing what God has kept you from. For you to find your purpose. I mean, just think of it, Jonah. God causes a storm. God causes a fish. But here's, here's, here's the most unbelievable part. I read it. And the Lord spake to the fish. Come on, say that with me. And the Lord spake unto the fish. Fish, you've had your last day. Fish, you've had your last turn. Fish, I'm speaking to your problem because you're about to be vomited up. I was almost going to title this sermon Nineveh or vomit? That's it. That's it. If you're not in Nineveh, whatever you created is just vomit. What you're living in right now is just vomit. That's all it is. You can put all the cologne and perfume you want on it, but at the end of the day, it's just vomit. There's Nineveh. God said, I've spoken to it. His cage. I spoke to his jail. I spoke to his issue. I said, well, you're done. I'll do what Jonah can't do. I'll do what Jonah doesn't have the power to do. I will do what needs to be done to get Jonah to his purpose. I felt the Lord tell me God's going to speak to the well today. 
you've been caged up too long. You've put limitations on God. You're starting to get comfortable in the well's belly. And I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, God told me he's going to speak to some wells today and say, you're about to vomit them up because they're going to Nineveh. There's an army in this church. There's men and women. There's families that are rising up in this church and say, God, you didn't call us just to play it safe and be nice and kind and be cute. God, you called us, Lord, to be disciple makers. You called us to gather in groups and to love people and enfold people and help people walk through their struggles and help people find their way to you, God. And I've allowed this well. I've allowed my past experiences. I've allowed what's been done to me. I've allowed, Lord, I've, been, I've allowed these things, God, so to rob me of where you want me to be. So I'm speaking it over this church. You're about to come through. You're about to be vomited out. And would y'all stand in this house? No more excuses. No more excuses. You are blood bought and your Holy Ghost spilled, spilled, Holy Ghost filled. You're divinely shaped. You are created by God. You have the mark of eternity on your life. And you want to do this in a cute way, in a manageable way. And you're in the well's belly. They're soul winners and Bible study group leaders and warriors in the spirit and there's worshipers extraordinaire and there's bold creative faith workers and walkers and men and women of, of that, that would speak into things and declare into environments and dominions and atmospheres and kingdoms and then the enemy wants you to you got a flat tire and take you out. Come on. I know I'm preaching to people. I, I'm telling you, I know what I'm telling you is true. It's not about the well's belly. It's about Nineveh. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. And then verse 1 of chapter 3, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. He's calling again today. I've called you. I've spoke your name. I've put my hand on your life. Come on, church. Come on, families. Come on, dads. Come on, moms. Come on, teenagers. Yeah, you made a few mistakes and caused a few chaos and you got a little pain in your life. I understand that. It's real. It's detrimental if you let it. I get it. I promise you. But God didn't call you just to have the pain. God called you to have a purpose. I'm preaching not to your neighbor. I'm preaching to you. This is not for your husband. This is for you. It's not for your mom or dad, kids. This is for you. When are you going to step into that moment and say, God, I'll go. And who can tell? Jonah, if you never showed up, there would never be a king that would say, and who can tell? Who can tell if you lost kids, you lost family, you lost friends? Who can tell? Who can tell? God won't change your life and change your family, change our community, change our world. Would you bow your heads right now? In Jesus' name, would you do that? Come on. Lord, I've spoken the words that you bid me. God, it is, I believe the desire of the Lord is shape a church, God, that is truly on mission. And the world and has thrown its best punches and the enemy has said its biggest lies. 
there's havoc among us. There's real pain in our house. There's a real struggle, God, that we're working through, but you never asked us to overcome all of that. But I need you to do something I can't do myself. Speak to the fish. If you'll let me out, if you'll get me out, I'll go. I would like for as many of you that can, and for our guests, you're welcome to stay where you are. But for our church family, would you come all across this house? Whatever God is speaking into your spirit, would you come? Man, I feel a prophetic voice in this church.